Kathleen. Good morning. Good morning. So today we have Kathleen Peterson with us, who is the, the founder and the chief director, uh, sorry, the executive director of Aaron and Her International. So Aaron and Her International is an organization which has been developed over the years to try and help people who are in need of some degree of counseling, some degree of support, strengthening, equipping. Um, and so today, Kathleen is going to, to share with, with us something of, of her process, her protocol, and give us a little bit of insight into what she does in terms of resilience and the idea of the boundary between resilience and burnout. So Kathleen, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So could you just run us through what is the, the process that you do or involve with? Um, we're involved in a process of working with leaders um, in different um, areas of life, um, both in the uh, sacred and secular community, um, to help them process through the, the struggles of uh, leadership and often leading to the issues of burnout. So we work in processes of um, uh, working with leaders at an early stage to avoid burnout, um, to when they're in halfway there, and then when they're completely burned out. And often by the time they get to the high levels of burnout, they've usually uh, made quite a few mistakes and there's a process of restoration that we have to take um, these leaders through in order to um, bring them back to a healthy place, uh, physically, emotionally, um, uh, psychologically, spiritually, in every aspect of their lives. Right. Um, how exactly, what, what exactly do you do in terms of process? Um, part of the process, the first uh, step that we always do in the process is uh, a, a temperament test that we do. Um, it's, it's a 16 question uh, questionnaire that we have the person go through that tells us about the person's temperament, how they are wired, what their basic needs are. Yeah. Uh, because in knowing that, that helps us to create a custom made process of uh, work with them and treatment for uh, these people or preventative treatment. Right. For, for burnout, for, you know, and with burnout being exhaustion and everything that comes with it. Yeah, yeah. So some of your work is, is to prevent people getting to that stage. So it's, it's building the resilience in, in whatever field of endeavor they're at. And, and I guess like right. I say some of it is, is working in the crisis, right in the middle of the heat of it. And then there's the right. post-crisis work. Right, correctly. There's a, there's a, there's four stages that we go through. Um, well, yeah, four stages. So one is preventative. We try to prevent it. If we are called into a crisis situation, and sometimes we're called called in because um, it's what we call the the bomb went off. Yeah. Um, the person um, let it go too long and got to the place where they began to create damage. Um, many have ended up being fired from their jobs because of it. Um, the low productivity, so, you know, some of it is simple as low productivity. Others is um, cases where uh, leaders have blown up. And um, I know one case where we actually started throwing chairs. I mean, they reached this point where they went yeah. so far that it actually became an aggressive reaction to their burnout. So we take them through this process of what we call first, um, first response, intensive care, um, uh, physical therapy, yeah. you know, because that's what it's called in the, if it were physical, and then follow up, which is a process of taking a person who is already in full blown burnout through a process of restoration um, and wholeness again. Okay, so if I can come back to the, the, the pre-burnout bit. So I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm say mid-management in some organization and I'm feeling the pressure. So right. 
and somebody says, well, I think Johnson could do it some help. So just walk me through how you approach that from a, a not on the other side of the, the, the line, so to speak. Okay, okay. The, the very first thing I would do in a meeting with you is, is of course, listen. Yeah. You know, listen to where you are, how you're feeling. Very, it's very common that I hear in this first interview, I feel like I'm wearing a jacket that's not made for me. Okay. Um, I'm feeling pressure. Um, I'm, I can't sleep. Those are some early signs of, of distress. Yeah. Um, um, I'm always afraid that they're going to see that I really don't know what I'm doing. You know, those are some of those internal phrases and, and statements that we hear on early on. So the first thing that I do is I ask them to take the APS test, which is the temperament test we do. It's a diagnostic tool that I use um, to help understand that person's need. So I would take it, you know, for you, you would do it. And I would know if you recharge, how you recharge. Do you recharge mm -hmm. being with people, not being with people? Yeah. is a big project in this in this huge um, uh, venture going to be highly stressful or energizing so as we as I get that when I get that instrument down and we um, back you know I do the 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 um, I analyze it then we sit down and begin to discuss you know first of all to see okay yeah you know if you agree with the results mm -hmm. you know we've had a few people that go I don't agree with the results um, but it's interesting because this particular instrument has a 90, uh, 92% accuracy rate. Okay, so it's well validated. It's well validated. It's been tested on thousands of people around the world um, mm -hmm. in multiple cultures. So, and the questions are so simple that they're not culturally tied. Right. Um, you know, we've seen in um, um, Asian, European, um, American, South American, you know, people of every, and the accuracy is, is incredible. Uh, and then I begin to ask the question in terms of, let's say you're a person who comes out on this test um, because it measures in three areas and the area that measures whether you're an introvert or extrovert, um, you know, how much time you're getting to spend creatively alone, how much time are you dedicating yeah. to that? And yeah. then, you know, if you're a person who is, has a high need for alone time to have full tanks. And you're telling me, oh, I get a half an hour in the morning and then I'm with people until mm. I get home and, mm. and go to bed. Yeah. There, there are temperaments that need sl more sleep. Right. It, it, it's even a physical thing. And um, I had one last week, I had a leader who was in crisis and I saw that she had this temperament that needed a lot of sleep and she was uh, on the ver verge of breakdown. Yeah. And um, so I said, how many hours are you sleeping? She said five. But um, I need you to get to seven hours minimum, eight better. Yeah. She looked yeah. at me she's like, I can't do <laughs> that. Can't. And I'm like, <laughs> and, she, and I told her, then you won't be able to do your job. You will have no creativity. Hmm. Why? Because the way you are wired, you need that sleep to regenerate in order to produce. Yeah. And each person is different. Each person, the instrument we use is, um, it sounds like I'm, I'm selling the instrument. Uh, but the, uh, oh, wait, the please. instrument, yeah. yeah. Well, and in, in what I like about this instrument is um, there are, in terms of possible combinations, there are 4,272 possible combinations. So when I'm going to do Johnson's um, test, it's going to show me how unique you are. And so okay. the treatment, you know, the, the, the initial, just focusing on how you're wired is going to be unique to you. And then we begin to look at lifestyles and we also begin to, to it's at one point get to looking at what are the internal statements that you are making? Mm -hmm. um, what is the internal dialogue that you are speaking to yourself? is sabotaging your okay. a healthy self-care. Yeah, yeah. So for example, um, if, um, if one of the statements that you have playing out, um, I had this just past, this past week, I had a corporate director that I was meeting with 
And his father always told him, if you are not number one, you are nothing. Right. That's a pretty strong statement. It's a very strong yeah. statement. Yeah. And he actually had to, to, uh, to admit that that was a false statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That his value wasn't in, in what, whether he was number one or not. It was in doing the best job that he could within his capability, the difference between perfection and excellence. Yes, which is huge in itself. Which is huge. It's a huge difference between perfection and excellence. So when you work with, with leaders, is that different in, in any form or fashion than working with non-leaders? It is in the sense that the problems start out the same. Right. You know, so, the, the basic problems, a problem in the marriage, a problem with a, um, you know, it could be an internal problem of never feeling enough. Um, the difference is if you can imagine a, a person who is not a leader, they're more like a pot sitting on a stove and the fire is under it where a leader is living in a pressure cooker. Okay. So the intensity of the exact same ingredients is much more because of this pressure cooker that they're living in. Um, the, the level of expectation that is on them both externally and internally. Um, leaders tend to live in glass houses where, where everybody, um, yes. Everybody feels like they have the right to criticize them. Yeah. Um, they, they, you know, we see this with political leaders. We see this with um, um, actors and actresses, and and many of them just because they became famous at whatever level, whether it's in the organization mm -hmm. or outside, that every, you know, it's like the world feels like it has the right yeah. to throw stones at them yeah. and to criticize and to have an opinion on their lives. And that can, and particularly based on your temperament, how you're wired and your the shadows from your past, what I call the shadows from your past or the lies of your past, mm -hmm. um, all of those factors coming together in this pressure cooker um, causes um, the whole process of, of, uh, of a breakdown happen yeah. much, in a much more concentrated way, yeah. yeah, in a more explosive way, yeah, you know, and and sometimes you you walk in and you know I've walked into the situations where the top is blown off the pressure cooker and the kitchen is a mess. <laughs> yeah, a pretty messy situation, I would imagine. So yes, in terms of the the work you you do, so with leaders. How, how do you, is, is there any sense of, so you, 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 you walk through the, the sort of family history, the, the influences, the wiring, et cetera, which mm -hmm. I guess could be described as um, mental or, or psychological or personality based. Is there any sense of what you do in terms of the, the spirituality of a person? Absolutely. Um, uh, much of the work that we do is because included in the leaders that I work with are church leaders and within the religious community. And um, so we deal with um, with their view of um, and their struggles in every aspect of their life. You know, their, their, their struggles with, with their identity, their struggles with um, how they perceive, for example, God or God, you know, or themselves mm -hmm. in the universe. Yeah. Um, and um, because that's a huge factor. It's a yeah. huge factor in terms of, um, you know, person's spirituality, um, you know, their family, their spirituality, their, their uh, view of themselves, uh, their yeah. identity. Who am I? Am I my job? Yeah. Yeah. Am I, am I my family? Am I, am I a value? Do I have significance? 
you know, all of these factors are factors that we look at in dealing and, you know, getting to the core and, and really the, at the very, very core of your identity is your spirituality. When you boil it all the way down yeah. to the very essence. Yes. It's, it's who am I? In the, in the context in the context of where you're at where so, you are in the universe where you are in relation to to God to everything yes yeah so if, if we were to, to look at that that boundary line between resilience and, and burnout have you ever or what is your experience of do you have any personal experience of crossing that line? Uh, yes, a resounding yes. <laughs> um, I have I have experienced a burnout twice in my life. Um, I've had, uh, you know, there's a, there's a little burn that you get on your hand, which I've gotten lots of those. A cook gets lots of burns on their hands. Um, twice I have been to the point where the burnout was so severe. The first time was in my late twenties. Um, and I, I reached a level of burnout. It took me a year to recover. And I didn't, um, I, you know, I didn't have the tools at that point yeah. to really understand. Um, it came back after a year of, of, um, stepping back, stepping back in leadership a little bit. Um, and, um, giving myself, my body, my organism. In, um, you know, body, soul, and spirit, an opportunity to rest, uh, to regroup. Um, I went back to work again. And, you know, it's like the frog. If you've heard the uh, um, analogy of the frog in the water. Yeah. Um, where if you put a frog in lukewarm water on a stove and slowly heat it up, it doesn't jump out and it ends up cooking. Well, I ended up reaching burnout again in my late 20s, early 30s. And this one was severe enough to where it took me about three years. Um, I does. I was in a very high level of um, in my organization, very high level of leadership. I had to step back to a lower position of my own accord. I asked uh -huh. to step back because uh -huh. I was. I had an ulcer. I was having. I started having problems with my thyroid um, because the thyroid is one of the one of the bodily functions that's affected by stress. Um, I was angry a lot. Um, I was, uh, crying a lot. I was, um, and I was what I called turtling. <laughs> I was going <laughs> into myself yeah. and disconnecting from the world, um, um, because I was in survival mode. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that, that, um, would have been a, a very difficult place to be at, but, the, the, the analogy, I think, is, is interesting because I think a lot of us get that, yeah, that frog in, in the water that just gets hotter and hotter, but you don't actually notice it's getting hotter and hotter. Yeah. So do you have any mechanism in which you can help people recognize where they are in, in this, on that sort of scale? Yes, I do. I do. There's a questionnaire that I use on stress and burnout um, that I give to people that asks questions. Um, and these are, are even some of these questions you can even ask yourself as you go is how well am I sleeping? I mean, that okay. sounds like something it's, minor. Yeah, but it's major. But, are you, uh, but it's major yeah. <laughs> because then it's not just psychologically that you're struggling, but you're then struggling physically. Um, rest is in, incredibly important to creativity. Yes. Uh, a rested mind is a creative mind. Yes. Uh, so it's hard to produce. It's hard to create something new if you're if you're if you're tired. Um, the you know some of the other things that you see is irritability, where the, where you usually were not irritable. So it's a change. Like for example, if I'll give an example for me. I'm not an angry driver. You know, I, I can drive in traffic and if there's traffic and if I hit every red light, um, if it's bumper to bumper traffic, I usually get it, you know, in my mind, I usually see it as the time to rest. Oh, good. We're going to sit in traffic and I'm just <laughs> going to breathe for a minute. 
you know, okay, I'm late for the meeting, but I have a good excuse. I'm sitting in traffic. Uh, I, think you can, I think you can call that a superpower. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and but when I I know I'm starting to get in trouble if when I reach when I hit traffic and when I'm driving, I'm getting angry at my fellow drivers around me. That's one of my signals yes. that that I am um, that something's off. Why? Because usually when I'm in a good place. I'm not an angry driver. And so there's been a shift in me, which indicates to me that something's going on internally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that, um, that probably speaks to your level of self-awareness as to knowing, right. knowing what are, the, what are the, the trigger points that are happening or in different situations. Right. And, and one of the things you'll see, a lot of times I'm using this in a very general way. Um, because there are exceptions on both sides. Generally with men, you'll see that men will get angry mm -hmm. where women will get weepy. You know, they'll, they'll start tearing up. But that doesn't mean I've seen the opposite too. I've seen men all of a sudden get very emotional. Yeah. Um, and they usually weren't. They usually were very much in control of their emotions. Um, and I've also seen women get very angry. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm using is a generalization, you know, more like a 60 to 40 mm -hmm. uh, generalization of what you see. Um, uh, you'll see muscle tension, you know, a lot of muscle tension at work. Um, you'll see um, a, a lack of creativity for yep. somebody who is creative. Again, you've got to know what the what your baseline is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what is your baseline? You know, what is what is rested and healthy for you look like? Um, uh, you know, a struggle to make decisions when, for me, I am, because of the way that I'm wired, because of my temperament, decision-making is pretty easy for me. It's not difficult for me to make decisions. And I'm not, I'm not afraid of making decisions. When all of a sudden I find that I've, I'm like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I make a decision? Mm -hmm. That's a sign that's that I need to rest. I need to back off. I need to take a few days off for mental yeah. health yeah. to reset. Yeah. When I, when I have any decision, I know who to call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but it, but it is it is um, interesting in the sense that, like I said, it, it's being aware of, of where you are in. A particular situation, and then there's also that that gender difference between male and female. So yes, some of the, the stuff that I've heard in terms of um, when people have crossed that burnout line is is that the women tend to emotionally um, either raise the temperature or, or back away, whereas men tend to be more cynical. So yes. rather, rather than the emotion coming to the front, cynicism comes to the front. Comes to the front, right. Sarcasm, um, you know, and again, what is your normal level of sarcasm? Mm -hmm. And is it, is, it, is it becoming hurtful? Yeah. And, and we see that, we see it in men and women, and that's really a temperament thing as to where that sarcasm, that's another one of my indicators. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I have uh, within me, and it actually shows on my temperament, that um, that sarcasm comes very easily to me. Uh, so I keep that horse reined. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I keep that really tightly reined um, because it can be, when let loose to run on its own, it can be very destructive. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of being uh, something that, you know, because wit and sarcasm can be used to uh, to let go of steam in the group, bring laughter, um, bring mm -hmm. enjoyment. I'm not against a level of, of wit and sarcasm. Yeah. Yeah. It's how it's used. Correct. And and when yeah. you see a person who's very witty, all of a sudden become studying and ugly in their sarcasm, you know, there's that the that the that the heat indicator. It's good in their car up. is is going up. <laughs> yeah, no, very true. 
So have you um, experienced where people who are uh, doing, you know, um, the best that they can in difficult circumstances and trying their best and all the rest of it, and I had it that the, the gauge is going this way and thinking, hold on, you you need to 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 pull it back, or you need to to find a a different path, or even a different career. Be mm-hmm. it that, that says, hey, that something needs to happen right now after you've done the the initial sort of work. Right, in terms right. of temperament, etc. So, speak to me a little bit about that now. One of the things that I have found is sometimes um, people will stay in a um, in a job or in a position longer than they should. You know, it's time. It's time to move to something else. Um, It can be for various factors, Um, you know, for somebody who is spiritually connected, um, you know, and and what what God thinks it would be that, you know, they feel like they're supposed to be somewhere else, you know, that God is calling them to somewhere else. Or it could be that a person has lost their passion for it. I mean, it's no longer um, this no longer inspires me. It's no longer motivates me. Um, or they reach their goals. I mean, there's some people who they, they've, they've already reached the goal in this. And so they're dis- dissatisfied and then it becomes a problem. And so there is times, and I have looked at people and advised them, you know, look in, let's go, let's look at and consider other directions that you could go and look at options based on their temperament, their experience, their talents and their passions. Mm. to um, to something new because it may be that something new is that is uh, is awaiting them out there and something that they're either better suited for or now suited for. Yes, yes. Uh, that, you know, that, because there are things that we are now suited for that we were not suited for a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I can relate to that one um, in the sense of, I know when I um, moved out of, of my medical career that it, it was in a five-year period when I was experiencing what I describe as approaching burnout and rust out yeah. at the same time. Mm-hmm. So the, the burnout is, is because of the, the mounting paperwork and, and the protocols and all the rest of that that comes, which is part and parcel of, of any system. But right. at the same right. time, and some more than others, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at the same time, because uh, I'm no longer engaged mentally or emotionally with, with this world, I'm rusting out because my brain is saying, I'm "Not interested in this. Can we can we do something new?" And and I think that that is part of what people face. Now, two mm-hmm. two almost opposing things can be happening at the same time. Um, it's true it's true I um years ago I read a book this was my senior year in high school so you know we're talking uh, a couple years ago <laughs> we'll call it a couple years ago. <laughs> um I read a book and it was called it's the name of it's future shock yes and um I don't know if you've read the book but it's oldie I mean we're talking in the 1980s Um, But I think of it so much in the world we're living in today, because part of um, we're talking about, you know, moving to something because it's it's now time to move. This is no longer, you know, I've 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 spent the time that I'm supposed to spend here. Yes, it's time to go to something else. But there's an other factor that that contributes to burnout and. and very high levels of anxiety. And it's the the velocity at which change is happening in our world. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who can cope with that better than others. And that's one of the things that you have to look at in in the industry that you're in, whatever industry you're in is, uh, for example, let's say you're in the telephone industry, (laughs) you know, making cell phones. It is a competitive, high-paced, 
constantly changing. Constantly, we got to get better. Um, by the time the new phone, the new iPhone 12 came out, it was already obsolete. Yes. I mean, because they've already got something else. And that high paced level of functioning for some people based on, you know, their wiring, their, um, their knowledge, their experience is a pace that is not healthy for them and doesn't work for them. There are some that that pace, when, and even age. <laughs> mm. I, you know, I know that I could go, you know, 30 years ago at a pace that I can't go at my age now. That's very hard to admit, uh, very hard to admit. Um, but I'm sure- Because you, internally, I'm very young. <laughs> <laughs> and externally as well, Kathleen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but, but I'm sure as well that, that um, for, for people who have a, a strong sense of purpose, a uh, mm -hmm. calling if you want, that that, that drive, is is not even based on on who you are. It's 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 beyond that, and I think that that perhaps is a different level. Right. You know, by the time you get to calling, then you're working on. Um, you know, I know in my life that that I have a very very clear view of my calling. Hmm. Um, but in that. And here's, I think, where, where the trip up happens for, for those who have a clear sense of the goal, a clear sense of the calling, a clear sense of the transcendent mm -hmm. in our lives, is that um, my dad used to tell me, if, if you don't, you know, it's dangerous to fall into either pit. Um, you know, there's when you're driving on a road, there's a ditch on the right and there's a ditch on the left and either ditch is dangerous. And so, you know, finding that place where we have the clear calling and functioning in that clear calling with wisdom. And and the wisdom comes in in the understanding. And for me, because I was a runner yeah. um, in my in my uh, uh, teens and in my 20s. In early 30s, I was a runner. I did long distance running. And one of the things that I remember, I would run, um, um, I think in the UK, you all use miles, correct? Not kilometers, you use miles. Well, well I, I have to confess, uh, two years ago, I started running and I use kilometers. You use kilometers, okay. Yeah. All right, well, I would um, um, only, hear, be, only, uh, only because the kilometers makes it sound better. <laughs> it sound like you're doing better. Uh, yeah. well, let's talk in terms of miles uh, so that the common, you know, so the person who doesn't know what kilometers are. Um, so I would run, um, uh, my average was uh, three days a week, uh, three to four days a week, I would run two miles. Okay. And then okay. twice a week, I would run 10. Um, this was back when I was in really good shape. Um, and it was, it was, it was my goal. And then I would have a day of rest. And, um, I remember one time I was running with a friend, we set out to run two miles. So we're running and we're running at two miles and about a mile and a half in my friend said to me, why don't we just go ahead and do 10? Oh. And I couldn't do it. Hmm. I actually at about five miles, I ended up having to stop. Um, because I didn't set my pace for 10 miles. I set my pace for two. Yes. And I think what ends up happening is many times when we have this call and this vision, we don't realize that many times that's a long distance run. You know, it's a marathon. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not a sprint. And so we don't create a, we don't create a pace uh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually to where we can make it the 10 miles, or if you're doing a marathon, the 32 miles, you know, the, we can't make it because we set our pace for two miles. Yeah. Yes. And I think that that's important because um, not, not only are you running whatever sense of calling you have, but there are other factors right. in your life that you've got, you've yep. still got your family, social, work, 
whatever else is going on, a calling mm -hmm. doesn't sit in isolation. No, no, it does not. And what good, I say this when I work with religious leaders, what good is it to win the world if you lose your children? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you if you're so busy doing your job, even if it's a divine calling. Yeah. But those those three little ones at home, you end up losing because you were never there. And you didn't have balance in your life. Um, and, you know, and here's the reality about calling, especially when it's something that you know that that you're that it's beyond you it's a transcendent calling mm -hmm. is that you're not the only factor in it and i think that's where we get confused as we think it's on me but if the calling is a divine calling if it is a calling beyond if it is a calling from god then he's the one who bears you know god's the one who bears the weight right okay and i and that's what i learned with my last 3 year recovery it, it stopped, I felt like that the burden was on me to accomplish the calling. Hmm. That if I didn't do it, it wouldn't happen. And as soon as we get in that, well, if I don't do it, it won't be done. If I don't do it, it won't be done right. If I don't do it, then we are trapped. And at some point, we're going to burn. Yeah. I, I think of that in terms of um, I am not the, the whole jigsaw. I am a piece that fits in the bigger exactly. bigger jigsaw. And whether or not, exactly. if I think I'm the whole thing, then I'm in serious trouble. And so would be anybody else who's trying to follow my example. Exactly, exactly. And, and it's hard, um, it's, you know, it's hard to accept that. It takes a level of humility. Yeah. Um, and, and humility is a big piece in the, in terms of leadership, humility mm -hmm. is a big piece in avoiding burnout yeah. is being able to say, I am not all powerful. Yeah. Yes. I am not indispensable. I am not, I'm important. Yeah. But there's the difference between being important and being indispensable. Yes. I recognize that one because as soon as you leave an organization, within five years, they'll look back and say, who are you? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you, you get humbled very quickly. <laughs> very, very quickly. When you go back there and say, Johnson who? Yeah, I yeah. know. But that, know. That, that is the way it, it works within any organization. The organization moves on. Right. Yeah, so, and it, it, it's difficult when your when your identity is found in your in the accolades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, because then when you go back and they don't remember they the in your in your in your goal, um, I saw this in an organization I worked for. Um, my goal was to establish certain things, and I left and I came back, and you know, it's been now twenty years. And what I started is still functioning within and, and it created, it became part of the ethos of the organization, but nobody remembers that I was the one who started it. Yeah. And I remember standing there and something in me, in me wanting to tell everybody I was the one who started it. And that uh, small voice in my head went, no, you don't need to. Yeah. Nobody needs to know it was you. Yeah. You know, it's it, the most important thing is that this healthy um, uh, system was put into place that is still producing even to this day. Um, but it is, it, it bites your ego a little bit and it knocks you down. <laughs> it, it, it certainly does. I, I, I know it in, in terms of coaching people. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there's somebody I, I, I would like to think I was key in. Well, I, I know I was key in, in him starting a, a fitness and nutrition program. Right. And mm -hmm. two years later, when I questioned him, and I say, so I believe your, your mental health has gone significantly up. And he said, yeah, yes, da, 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 da. And it's fantastic. And you can hear it in the voice and all of that. 
but you would never hear, well, so who started you on that? that? <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. So what I told yeah. you worked. Huh? <laughs> so what I told you worked. But uh, that, yeah, you know. so it does. It does kind of like think. Hmm, okay, yeah. you've done. You've done what you're meant to do, and you. You for that point in time, you've achieved something, be it big or small. Right, right. My um, my father was um, was a leader growing up. He was, um, it was funny. I read John Maxwell's uh, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And I had to laugh because I was like, my dad did all this. This was, it was obvious to me because it was what I saw my dad do my yes. whole life. Um, you know, he was just such a well-balanced leader. And every once in a while I'll call him. And especially if I'm kind of going through something tough or somebody didn't, um, you know, make that connection. Um, I don't get the thank you that, that anyone would want to hear. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so funny because my dad, uh, and I laugh at it, but he always says, well, good. That way you stay humble, honey. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, uh, dad, that's not what I wanted to hear from my daddy. But, <laughs> uh, but, it's, but it's true. I mean, there's something so healthy when we, uh, not low self-esteem. We're not talking about mm -hmm. that. We're no. just understanding um, that, that um, that our value doesn't come from the accolades. Our value yeah. doesn't come from the from all the trophies, the, the awards we have, um, but from who we are. Yes, and and so I imagine that that's like this this one ditch on this side of the road you're driving. Yes, on. that that's one of the, yes. the, the, the the louder the exactly. clapping, the more likely you are to fall in the ditch. Right. So. Yeah, you know, one ditch is one ditch is. Poor self-esteem. I'm nothing. I'm not worth anything. I'm a failure. The other one is I have to have the accolades. I have to have. I have to have all these trophies. I have to have all these plaques on the wall. You know, um, because then the, the 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 calling, the vision, the goal is not clear. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, if you do become the the, the trophy rather than right, you you become the whole jigsaw. You become the whole jigsaw. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, in, you know, so one of the, one of the exercises that I do, and it helps me on, on multiple levels, even burnout, and it sounds like it wouldn't, is, is one of the things that I have told um, my, my team is that I, I am um, praying for the day, hoping for the day that when somebody goes to Aaron and her, Mm -hmm. and um, is seeking help and they go who started it yeah. that that people have to go I don't know let me look that up yeah. you know yeah. that that it, it grows to that point where it, and that was a conscious decision I made mm -hmm. to to keep myself in check but in, even that is interesting in, in what you say so if if I come to you and I say, well, by the way, Carrie, who's Aaron and who's her? Because I guess a lot of people may not know where that comes that comes from. So just just inform us if you would as to where that okay, comes from. Okay, okay, I will. Um, in um, you know those who are in either the Jewish community, the Christian community, um, and uh, know the scriptures will know of this story. It's a it's a a story of the of the Israelites that were um, in the time of Moses, and Moses was in the middle of a battle. Um, the the people of Israel were in the middle of a battle with the Amalekites. Um, and um, the story tells us that that Moses was standing on a hilltop. And he had his rod. And as long as he held his rod up, the children of Israel were winning. Every time he would drop the rod, um, they would lose. Well, according to, to what, um, what it tells us, the story tells us in Exodus, he was 80 years old. Now, it's hard for a 20-year-old yes. to hold his rod, uh, hold a rod up for hours. Hmm. Um, in fact, usually you're hurting within five minutes, uh, by 10 minutes, you're burning. It's tough, but much less this older person. So his, um, his brother, and they, um, which was Aaron, and there was another gentleman present. They think it was maybe an in-law 
whose mm -hmm. name was Hur, H-U-R, came beside him. They found a rock for him to sit on and they held his arms up through the entire battle. And that's what Aaron and her does. That's what I do. That's what um, my team does. Um, we have teams in different countries. We're right now in Brazil, Colombia, in the States. Um, we've got people we're training in, in Europe. Um, we come alongside leaders and we hold their arms up. Yes. Um, and I always tell my team, we're not Moses. Yes. <laughs> you know, we're Aaron and her. We're the ones who stand beside so that the leader is able to, to keep their arms up yeah. until yeah. the battle's over. And uh, so that's the story of who Aaron and her are and where we got our name is, is just um, this whole concept of we come alongside and support. Yeah, yeah. and, and that, that in itself speaks of humility. It's, it's part, of, part of the ethos, I guess, in which, um, your organization works in, in that because people will come along and say, her? who's her? Yeah. Who's Aaron? Moses, Moses I, I think I remember <laughs> from, from, from my school days, but the other two are yeah. no idea. Or the old movie. <laughs> or the old movie, <laughs> The Ten Commandments of Carlton Heston. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, no, yeah it's, uh, it's an interesting story, though. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if, if I can flip the, the equation onto the organizational side of it. So I guess a lot of cultures within organizations are not the best, shall we say, and they, they may actually encourage people to push harder. So it's, it, I guess for, for me, it's like the stories within the banking sector at the moment, where you get all these, these young um, graduates in their 20s, late 20s, early 30s, and they're, they're working 12, 14 hour days um, mm -hmm. with no lunch, but, but a promise of, of a pot of gold at the end of it. Um, yeah. And so there's organizations like that who, who quite are quite happy to push people there along the way. So how, how do you deal with, with organizations? Because you're working both on a, in an individual and, and the, the culture that they're in. So can you right. speak to me um, about that? Certainly, certainly. One of the things that I do is because um, like I specifically, um, I have team members who work with middle, like what you would call middle management and um, uh, level, but I specifically work with leaders at, you know, at the senior level. Yeah. And um, so one of the things that, that I try to infuse into, into them is an understanding of thinking of longevity. Um, you, we understand the concepts and it's interesting because I've even seen it with, um, you know, even the person who's most driven, they understand physically, if I'm going to run a marathon, Mm -hmm. I have to eat right, I have to eat right, sleep, exercise, have balance in my life, uh, train, and, um, and even have that, you know, making sure to have the day off. Yes. You know, when I used to train, when I used to run, that day off was very important to not create damage. And so one of the things that I work with with the leader, it, leaders at the, at the very top levels of of the organization because the personality, the character of the organization is a direct response to the character and the personality of its leader. Right. So if, if the leader, yeah. They're, they're the ones so, who set the culture. They set the culture. They are the ones who, who their DNA begins to filter its way down all the way to the person working on the, uh, on the assembly line. Um, if, if, it's, if they are driven, if they are functioning out of an unhealthy place of my value is in last month's sales, uh, my value is in how much money I have. Now, now I'm not speaking to, uh, we've got bills to pay. That's a whole other kind of thing. Yeah. I'm talking about the driving is not 
how do we pay the bills? It's, I have to have X number of dollars in the bank mm -hmm. to feel of value. Um, that will make its way down, all the way down. So we talk about um, creating healthy, a healthy system for longevity. I'll even ask the question, how, do, how long do you want your organization to last? Mm -hmm. the, the, the process of growing an organization, you know, from a grassroots organization to a well-established, um, more corporate um, organization is a process that takes time. And, and I've seen over and over again that the ones that grow super fast because they stay 12, 14, 16 hours, sleeping three to four hours a night, um, having no social life, having no time of going out and, 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 um, and having fun or just being still and quiet for a little while and enjoying the mm -hmm. cup of coffee. Um, you know, everything is, is go, go, go. What ends, up what ends up happening is the organization dies out because it burns out. Um, and so we talk about what is your goal? Is your goal is part of that goal to not be not only be let's say world famous and have um, what well, McDonald's had uh, you know one of their goals was to have a McDonald's around the world um, every seven miles apart from each other. Uh, that was one of the goals they have, and they've almost achieved it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's been, but it wasn't overnight. You know, it's a slow process. It's a growing process and giving time to grow in a healthy way um, of taking care of yourself because then you you are the example. Yeah. Um, uh, this the past week, I had uh, um, one of my team members who her husband called me because um, she was staying up really late every night, getting up every morning working on her Sabbath day, on her rest day. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and she's newly married. And her new husband was like, um, we're, we're supposed to be in our honeymoon. <laughs> and, and she's working. And, um, and he says, and I know it's not your fault because she told me that you've never, you've never pushed her to do that. Hmm. And, I and I said, no, I have not. <laughs> I have not told her to do that. So I met with her and um, and began to say, I don't want you to work any more hours than I'm working. Right. And so I gave her my hours and I said, I, I do not, I don't want you working any more hours than I am working. Yeah. And she kind of looked at me like, well, then the job won't get done. The job will get done. We're in a team. We're all working together. We have each other's backs. Yeah. So that, that speaks you know, I, to a different value. Right. The, where and the, so, we, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The goal so is, we, not, it, and it's, the goal is not the goal. That's just part of the goal. It's part of the goal. And, and like I told her is, what good is it going to get to the goal and not be able to enjoy it because we've had a heart attack? Yeah. Or we've had, or we, we are crippled physically, because that's one of the things with burnout that I think a lot of people don't realize is how physical it is. Mm -hmm. um, that burnout that I got to um, in 40 years, I'm still paying the price physically for allowing myself to go that far. I still have physical problems that are directly related to, to that episode. My, pushing myself beyond the the capability of this organism yeah. to function. Yes. Yeah. That that that's really interesting uh, in terms of sorry, not not in terms of for yourself, because I'm sorry that that's the situation you're in. But I, I don't know that that most people would even acknowledge that hold on, where I am now in, in, in my physical being, or even perhaps my mental attitude mm -hmm. is directly related to crossing a boundary line. Yeah. And, but that doesn't take away from the truth of it. No. Whether I admit it or not, it no. is what it is. You know, it is what it is. 
but at, but at some point, um, well, as we were um, talking to someone else recently, you're saying in order to to become more resilient, you have to cross certain boundaries every now and then, and then come back. Mm -hmm. So you you yeah. you you. Not going as far as Nietzsche once said, you know, what what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I wouldn't subscribe yeah. to that, but the, the fact that you push beyond and then you pull back, you push beyond right. and you pull back, or even you are pushed to beyond because some of these things are, are not within your control. We in the last year we know that there's huge amounts of stuff that's not within our control. So we we're being physically, mentally, and spiritually pushed. Right, right. Yeah, and and I do believe, um, you know, and probably because of the physical, ex, you know, the the training that I had um, as a runner. You know, I remember running, and and it was funny because sometimes even in other areas of my life, I'll think back to those moments when I was running, and um, and you had to push through the wall. Right. you know, what they call a runner's yeah. wall, you yeah. know, yeah. where you're like, um, where you're counting. Um, you know, I, I remember thinking just 10 more steps, you know, 10 more strides. And I would, I would push through the pain to that. And then I would push through to the next one. Um, but there always needs to be a countermeasure. Um, if I have to push in a moment, if I have to push the boundary in the moment, if I have to push through the pain in the moment, because this moment is calling for it, I need to be already thinking about how I'm going to recover from mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. What I'm finding with the most leaders that I have worked with is they know they have to push. There's a job that has to be done. There's a yeah. deadline that has to be met. So tonight I'm not going to be able to sleep, but four hours. Why? Because tomorrow's the deadline. Um, something happened with the banking. We didn't get the money we needed on time. We didn't, whatever the factors were at yeah. work. Yeah. Um, yeah. The airline, um, you know, how many times I've been on a, an international trip and um, there was a delay. And so I missed my next flight, um, which meant I had, scheduled to sleep a good nine hours the night before before I had to teach the next or do the workshops and seminars the next day and I had four hours sleep and had to get up and do the workshop it happens it, it happens life. yeah that's life that's life that's yeah. life yeah but then you create a counter weight to that where you plan okay this happened what am I going to do to refill those tanks that, that's so excellent. when I know, yeah. does that make sense? So yeah, when yeah. I know I have an event that's going to deplete me, I'm always thinking of how do I recharge after that, which most people don't. And that's one of the things that we do with the leaders that we work with is we talk a lot about how to recharge your batteries. And that's the term we use is batteries. You have things that deplete your batteries. Yeah. And you, and you know, I have my cell phone here. There are things you're using it will deplete its batteries, but I have a plan to recharge this. I have a plug in my car. I have a plug by my bed. Mm -hmm. I have a plug on my office. I have places that I recharge this. Why? Because this has a job to do. And that job yeah. is going to deplete its energy. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the same happens physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And so, you, you know, when you push through that, first it's a, you're building your muscles. <laughs> Sometimes you have to push through to build the muscles, but then you have to rest the muscles. Correct. And, and most of the strength in, in terms of the physiology of, of muscle building comes at the rest point. It does. And that's, that's the way it works. Mm-hmm. Because right. if you keep pushing and pushing, you keep exercising. I remember I was, um, because I'm a very driven person, um, I would have what you would call an A-type personality. Um, uh, when I first started running, uh, my coach actually had to pull me to the side. And he's like, how long has it been since you rested? 
you know, like you did not run one day. And I'm like, no, I've been running three weeks now. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> and, and he sat me down and he explained how the muscles work and told me yeah. it's that your day of rest is as important as your days of training. Yeah, very true. The, the one I heard is, is, is um, stress plus rest equal progress. That's, right. the, that's the equation. So if you want oh, yeah. to progress Good. and you, you're just stressing without the rest, it, it actually is, yeah. is defeating the object. Right, exactly. And, and you know, it, and it, you'll, you'll know when the stress is getting too much by the signals, by your signals, begin to, you know, and this is part of the job that I do is helping um, the leaders that I work with recognize the indicators. Yeah. Um, you know, what are your indicators and what are strategies in each of the aspects of your life? You know, your home life, your work life, your play life, because that's important yeah. too, your play yeah. life, yeah. Uh, your, um, uh, your family, you know, did I say family? I think I said family. Family, it just mm -hmm. all the aspects of, of, of who you are, all the spheres in your life. Um, and sometimes one will draw, you know, one will, will diminish in, um, because you're giving to another, but you have to make sure to go back. To yeah, the and, I, and I think that's also key, isn't it? That we don't realize that, that we're, we're taking from this pot to put it in the other pot. Yes. So it's not simply saying, There's only a certain amount, there's a finite amount of energy that has yeah. to be shared through all of those spheres. Yeah. yeah. Kathleen, it's been fantastic talking to you. It's been you very, as well. Very enlightening. Um, and I appreciate your time and, and what, what you shared with us. There's been a lot of wisdom in, in the stuff that you do. And I hope and I pray that, that where you go in the future, the direction, the momentum that you're building will continue to whatever you're meant to do. So Thank you so very much. Thank you so uh, much. This really has been enjoyable and a pleasure to see you, Johnson. And um, in any way that uh, we can help and serve you, let us know. And I'm here, we're here, um, and we're here to be Aaron and her. Yeah. Come alongside. Thank you. And so um, just just tell tell us um, for, for people who don't know where where can they find you? What where is your presence in, on on the internet? I am located um, the the our international office is located in Central Florida. I live um, in a small town outside of Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, we live uh, so it's in uh, Titus. It's a town called Titusville which almost no one has heard of Titusville, but everybody's heard of NASA, where this town that you have to go through to get to NASA. Okay. Uh, and so if you want to see the, the rockets launch, you have to come through my town. Um, it's pretty much the only way, one of the only ways that you can get out to watch the, lock, the rockets launch. And, and um, have you got a website or... or Something we have like a website. Um, we have one right now that is uh, for the faith community. Yeah. Uh, which is um, ahim.org, ahiminc, sorry, I forgot the ink, uh, ahiminc.org, and you can see what we're doing in the faith-based community, and soon uh, we'll have for the corporate community, um, we're still working on a little bit of our paperwork mm -hmm. um, on the corporate side. Um, my husband's getting ready to retire from his job of working for um, well, by the time he retires, it'll be 40 years that he's worked in uh, for the local government as an accountant, yeah. and um, he will be partnering with me. And so we're we're making that transition now um, as he's partnering with me, which we're looking forward to traveling together and and uh, uh, fantastic because yeah. he, I, I'm usually the one on the plane going, and he's he's keeping the home fires burning here. Um, and so uh, within a couple of years, he'll be traveling with me and, and going and speaking and places like that. So, uh, so look for um, ahiminc.org. My contact information is on, on the page there. You can see a little bit about my background. Um, 
um, as well as uh, team members we have in other, in other countries um, that are also coming alongside helping uh, leaders in different aspects. Great, fantastic. Anyway, take care and all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Right.